Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kevin Galetz, and I'm a program facilitator working with the Regina District Industry Education Council in, and working in the SunWest School Division. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Candace Haddock, who is a pediatric surgeon working at Valley Children's Hospital in Madera, California. Candace grew up and went to school in Rosetown before beginning her post-secondary studies at the University of British Columbia. Uh, after she finished her first degree, she worked at the uh, Vancouver Aquarium for a while and then went back to school in, uh, at UBC and became a pediatric surgeon. Uh, there's probably more education to it than that, and she'll explain mm -hmm. that. But uh, I will uh, thank Candice for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to you now. Great. Well, thanks, Mr. Galetz, um, Kevin, for, for inviting me, and uh, thanks to all of you who are tuning in to learn a little bit more about what pediatric surgery is all about. Um, what I'm going to do over the next 15 minutes, probably to 20 minutes or half an hour is just basically explain my path and um, my some of my philosophies and just give you a taste of what it is a pediatric surgeon does. Um, I think growing up in Saskatchewan, I uh, in pretty rural Saskatchewan in Rosetown, I, I didn't have exposure to a pediatric surgeon. So uh, to me, I, I learned about this when I actually became a general surgery resident. So um, yeah, uh, and actually, I suppose a little bit earlier than that, maybe when I was a medical student, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a snapshot of, of all of that and, and my path to get there. And i um, happy to take questions that you have by email, my emails at the very end. So I, I bring this presentation to you from Madera, California, where my practice is. Um, uh, and I'm just going to work on here we go. Okay. Uh, so uh, today, I want to tell you um, over the course of the next 15 minutes, really who I am, my journey, the education, talk a little bit about the skills and traits that a pediatric surgeon may have and some of the settings uh, and tools I work in and with. And I'll also speak about the rewards. Sorry, I don't know why that has an apostrophe and challenges. Uh, I'm not a, a good PowerPoint presentation maker, but uh, <laughs> anyway, I apologize. I probably should have edited that a little bit more. Um, all right, so I have had kind of two careers as Dr. as uh, Mr. Galetz has mentioned. So my first career was working with marine mammals at the Vancouver Aquarium. So again, I, I graduated from um, Rosetown Central High School in 1997, which is a good while ago now. And then I spent the, most of my adult life actually in Vancouver, BC. I left um, after high school and went and did my undergraduate degree in marine biology, which is how I got connected to the Vancouver Aquarium. Um, and that was a four year degree. And then right now, as I said, I, I, I work in Madera, which is just right across uh, a highway from Fresno, California, which is where my, many of our, our staff and doctors live. Um, so I'm currently in Fresno, but working in Madera. Um, I used to be a marine mammal trainer, as I pointed out, and now I'm a pediatric surgeon, and here comes the story. So I won't focus too much on the numbers here from timeline, but I've talked to you a little bit about all of this already. Um, Rose Sound Central High School, then University of British Columbia for marine biology. Um, I actually spent a little bit of time being a whale watching guide um, uh, on whale watching tours out of, out of um, Steveston, which is south of Vancouver. Uh, which was really fun and that was kind of a part-time job I did while also working in a restaurant until I got my job as a marine mammal trainer at the Vancouver Aquarium in 2001 and I did that for for four years and when I got that job at at the aquarium um, I was very excited I loved marine mammals um, and I loved taking care of the animals I worked with I worked with whales and dolphins and seals and sea otters and a little bit with the sea lions and honestly for the first two years I saw no problems with that job I didn't really think about what my life would be like in 10 or 15 or 20 years I was just so immersed and honestly in love with that job that I, I didn't really think too much about the future but as time went on I started to think about what it was I wanted to do next and and I'll go into more details I, I realized that probably wasn't going to be sustainable for me to to finish all of my adult life and my career at the Vancouver Aquarium even though I did love it so I had to finish that and it was a little bit of a um downer because I I my next job wasn't really as interesting I, I worked in restaurants to keep uh, my income going while I was studying to get my prerequisites and, and study for the medical school entry exam, the MCAT. And 
that was for only a short period of time. Um, here's some pictures of the animals I work with. This is Emac on the left of the screen, a big blue male beluga whale. And this is um, a spinnaker. I'm in the water with him. He's a Pacific white sided dolphin. And this is my was my favorite part about that job, obviously, was spending time with these wonderful animals. And the nice thing about the Vancouver Aquarium is that they had a very, very much an education and research mission there. They didn't capture animals for the purpose of public display, which I, um, you know, I believe in that philosophy. And um, uh, we had animals that, all, that were rehab animals or that were caught a long time ago and could not be released to the wild. So that was fun. <laughs> And then after, uh, so after um, I finished, uh, you know, preparing for medical school, um, I, I went, um, I, I got accepted to UBC and I'll, t I'll spend a little bit more time on that. I, I applied twice. So now I did my undergrad at UBC and I went ahead and did medical school at UBC as well. That's a four year process. And then after that, I um, was accepted to the general surgery program, which was also through UBC. And that was at various hospitals in British Columbia, primarily in Vancouver, but we also did some rural rotations in other places. Um, and then, so five years of general surgery residency and then following that, <laughs> well, first when I started to do general surgery, I thought I wanna do general surgery and I just wanna get out and work. I'd already worked for you know about six years and. I wasn't interested in doing a lot of research and spending time in academic settings. I really wanted to get out and do my job and finish. But then I found myself quite interested in pediatric surgery as I was training in general surgery. And so that's yet another two years on top of the five years of general surgery residency on top of the four years of medical school. <laughs> so um, anyhow, that finished eventually. It all goes by in a blink of an eye when you look back. Uh, in 2018, I took a, a temporary position at the hospital that I trained at, at um, BC Children's Hospital. And that was really nice with the people that were really my family and mentors in pediatric surgery. Um, I did that for a number of months. And then I um, took a permanent job here in California in Madera in 2019. And so I've been here at Valley Children's Hospital ever since. Um, and here's the hospital that I work at. Um, George is the giraffe on the, the emblem. He's our uh, mascot. So in case you wanted to know where it is, this the blue on this map of California is the, the area that we serve. I think we serve something like 1.5 million children in the Central Valley of California. And so we have a really big range all the way out to the coast and all the way up north to Sacramento and down to an area called Bakersfield or Tehachapi. And so um, we help a lot of kids who whose parents, whose families are, are farm workers. So it kind of harkens back to some of my um, my upbringing, I suppose, in a way. This is a huge um, uh, food growing region. It's the bread, call it the breadbasket of America. Um, and they produce a lot of not grain is really um, actually quite quite a small crop here. They have lots of fruit and and nuts that are grown here and all sorts of um, vegetables as well. Um, this is just after this is here in my local area after lots of um, rain this this spring, which is really quite unusual. But it can be a very beautiful area, particularly in the spring. Um, so. The snail represents the amount of time uh, that it took me to become <laughs> a fully trained and functioning pediatric surgeon. So this is just something to think about. You know, um, I think at your stage when you're in high school, it's hard to imagine how much time you might want to spend training for something. And I think a total of 15 years might seem totally ridiculous, but um and it is in some ways. But I think uh, for what I do, it's completely appropriate. And so as I said, you know, the, the undergraduate degree is is a four years. Some people do only three years and they apply after their third year and get in. But it's more common for people to have at least one degree first. Then medical school itself is four years. So, again, that's eight years total. And then general surgery residency being five years and pediatric surgery fellowship two years, which is a really long haul. So some people come out with immense student loans and in the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, I, other people have support and means of getting around that. Uh, but anyway, it's quite a quite a big investment. Um, so you really have to, 
you really have to love it. So like, why on earth would anybody do that? And um, looking back, I'm very glad I did. I feel very fortunate to have the career I have. Um, I, I feel very lucky. It was a long, very long and very hard training. Um, during that time, actually, I'll go back during general surgery residency. Well, first of all, after med school, you're considered, you pass medical school, you're considered a doctor, but you're not really actually specifically trained to do any specific job, your family medicine um, practitioner, your general practitioner, they have to do two years of further training in order to actually um, be an independently functioning practitioner. And for me, m my duration ended up being seven years to do what I do. When you are, become a surgery resident or a resident of any variety, you're basically working more than a full-time job, but sort of like two or three full-time jobs. You end up working over 100 hours a week often. Um, uh, so there's very low levels of sleep. You work very hard. You're in very difficult situations, but you're working. And so it's very busy. It's not as though you're sitting down studying constantly. You have to study in addition to working those kinds of hours, which makes it very difficult. Um, and I think general surgery residency is probably one of the most time demanding and difficult training um, forms of training that that exists in in medicine and so um, again you really have to love what you do and as I said why on earth would you do it well if you find you love something I think you should do that whatever it is and so I believe in following your heart in work and in life um, and so I think your career choice my career choice is really about love and interest I think you can follow good leads and you can lean into good luck where you have it and then sometimes you do have to be practical, but um, I think your career choice should really be about love, interest, and maybe a little bit of practicality. Um, in case you don't recognize the structure, this is your heart muscle, okay, with some of the great vessels coming off. Um, all right, next. So here's my story. I, I, well, fell in love with the ocean when I was a kid. I went out to Vancouver with my family in Expo for Expo 86 and to visit some of my parents' friends who had a place on, uh, right on the coast and we did a boat trip. And I saw um, tide pools and I saw all of these beautiful and amazing organisms in tide pools. And in particular, I was quite enamored with the sea anemone, which you see over here. The ones that I was seeing were green sea anemones, but I thought they were absolutely amazing. And I'd never seen any animal like that and of course growing up in Saskatchewan we don't get a lot of exposure to that so for me it was easy I knew I wanted to be a marine biologist when I finished um, I fell in love with the ocean and wanted to study it and I was also very interested in human biology at that time and I thought well I'll do I will do marine biology and then I'll do medicine after I finish marine biology and and I think at that point I had a fairly simplified uh, perspective on the matter and that changed when I went to UBC for marine biology so I went and did my bachelor of science in in marine biology I um, realized that you know I was really in the middle of the pack as far as uh, <laughs> as far as um, being competitive for medical school and I, I just really you know transitioning from a smaller center like Rosetown to a really big center um, like UBC in Vancouver I I realized I, I felt like I really just needed to get through my training my get through my undergrad more so than try to be better than everybody else and try to get into medical school with that really competitive cohort just did not feel right for me so I continued to pursue my love of marine biology and when I finished my undergraduate degree I, I knew I wasn't interested in doing bench work bench lab work um, but I did still love the animals and the ocean and so one of my roommates as luck would have it was doing web design for the Vancouver Aquarium and she showed me that there was a job posting available so again I leaned into this little bit of good luck and I applied to the job and I got the job at the aquarium which was um just perfect for me at the time and I I thought it was great um I really enjoyed learning about the animals working with the animals learning how to take care of them we did all sorts of health care um we provided health care for them and obviously nutrition and um enrichment in the way of kind of interaction and uh, trying to keep their lives interesting you know obviously not living out in the ocean you need to provide a more interesting environment for them when they're in a smaller space and so um, this little guy in the right lower corner is his name is Tuvac uh, he's passed away since but he was a one of the baby beluga whales that was born at the aquarium and I was fortunate enough to work with him 
So again, I talked to you before about being, um, sometimes being practical. And after two years of just being completely enamored with the aquarium, I started to think about career development and what I would be doing in five and 10 years time. And then I thought, well, my hands are very cold in the winter. It was not really sustainable long term for me for, from that perspective. I know it's Vancouver, it's not Saskatchewan, but it's still cold when your hands are wet and you're feeding whales frozen herring. And so um, between that and just wanting to sort of keep learning, I, I decided, well, I think maybe, maybe I'll just pursue medicine, but I love animals. I'll, perhaps I'll go down the veterinary medicine route. After spending some time contemplating that, I realized that the, re well, the thing I loved about working with animals was that really special personal interaction that I had with the, with the whales and dolphins, seals and sea otters. And I knew I couldn't get that as a veterinarian. As a veterinarian, you know, you're treating sick animals or take, checking on animals that really don't have any interest in having any close relationship with you. And so I thought, well, I can have my own pets one day and I'm interested in medicine still. So I'll see you check in to see what what I need to do to get into to medical school. I, I kind of came back to that original interest that I have. So I think that is a, a bit of practicality. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> so, um, well, I, I applied to medical school, not really knowing what that was all about. I finished up, I had to do some prerequisites and, and take my MCAT and which I did twice because I did really I didn't do great on it the first time. And then I took a course and I actually <laughs> didn't do that great on it the second time either. I think I got the same score the second time after having paid for a course, which was quite funny. <laughs> so anyhow, that I overcame and then um, applied to medical school. I say it's an uphill battle because it was. I just did it all on my own to start off with. I applied across Canada and I did not get any interviews. And then I talked to a friend of mine who was in medical school and she, she helped me make my application and it was really the same application but instead of being a skeleton it was a complete body it, I had filled in all the details that I didn't realize um, I needed to do so I think it's really important when you're looking at things um, you have interests to talk to people who are involved and try to get some guidance and uh, that really made a difference for me I applied to only UBC that time and I got in without any trouble um, so don't give up if you're interested in something and it doesn't come to you at first um, all right, so then I got into medical school and, and it's a very funny thing in medicine, people will ask you when you first start, are you interested in medicine or are you interested in surgery? And I, for about one and a half to two years, did not understand what people were talking about at all when they were asking me that question. I thought, well, it's all medicine, isn't it? Like surgery, medicine, it's all part of medicine. I don't know what I want to do yet. My initial plan actually was to become a general practitioner so I could get out and get working, take care of people. I, I love working with people. And that was really my impetus for going back to medicine. And obviously the human biology part is very interesting to me, but I really love the connection with other people. So anyhow, in, a, in second year, we start doing some clinical rotations and that gets really intense in third year. My first rotation in third year medical school was a um, rotation on obstetrics and gynecology. And that is um, a somewhat surgical specialty. And it became very clear to me that that was my zone. I was very interested in surgery and um, the medical fields, though they were very interesting, were not nearly as appealing. And I just really felt like I clicked in that environment. I liked the fast pace, the, the taking care of patients on the ward and then um, seeing people in the emergency room in the clinic and then going off to the operating room and taking care of them there and hopefully getting them successfully home. And it was really a nice kind of full circle type of care where you actually get to see and feel the pathology in your own hands. And so I finally realized what, what people were asking and the question, the answer to the question they were asking for me was certainly surgery. I had some, I, I lucked into being paired up with some really awesome surgeons at a smaller hospital in North Vancouver. And um, there were residents there training, um, but at that time, I think one of them was out on maternity leave. And so I was really just me and the surgeons as a medical student. And that was a pretty special experience and um, made me realize that that's exactly what I wanted to do. I, it was very inspiring. It was really interesting. It was very busy. Um, and they just dealt with a lot of different problems and helped a lot of people. And so 
I, my heart got again pulled in that direction and I I applied to general surgery and um, got into that. Um, again, that's a five-year program. And in my second year of, pedi of, of general surgery, and let me tell you, the first two years was a struggle, were a struggle. I spent every day for two years asking myself if this is what I should be doing. I'd never done anything so hard in my life. Um, and it was a lot of time. There were a lot of sick patients. There was a lot of responsibility. There was a lot of pressure. It was scary at times, um, but thankfully there's lots of good people around. Um, and uh, it's really kind of a community effort to train a, a general surgeon. And I, I certainly felt supported by my community, but that uh, that was helpful at times, but other times where I, I really wondered if I was the best person for that job, was I, the right person to take care of these patients. Um, and um, I didn't know for sure, but I kept pushing on. I talked to people about it. I spoke with my program director to say, I'm not sure, you know, maybe I should do something else. I couldn't think of what that other thing would be. And I kept on and I finally landed on my pediatric surgery rotation as a second year resident. And I totally fell in love with that field. Um, my family and friends had commented, well, you seem so much happier right now. You know, I don't, what's going on in your life that's so different? And, and it was, I was doing pediatric surgery rotation and, and I, I love working with kids um, and the families and a very, uh, the very interesting uh, pathology that comes along with that. Uh, babies born with congenital anomalies um, and all sorts of things. It was just very interesting. And the, the people I worked with, the surgeons I worked with were, were amazing. And so I decided, remember being the kind of person that wants to get in and out of their training as quickly as possible and get working, which was my original plan. Well, I did the complete opposite. I then, then decided to do a two-year pediatric surgery uh, fellowship. Now, remember, um, um, it, it each stage here, so between from getting into medical school and then getting into general surgery and now getting into pediatric surgery, it's a whole application process each time. Um, and there's interviews all across the country um, it, at different programs. And uh, a lot of applications are sent out. A lot of letters are written and you have to get reference letters. And, and it's a very um, time, time intensive process. Uh, so I went through that one more time for pediatric surgery and matched to my, my top choice, which is um, UBC um, pediatric surgery at, at BC Children's Hospital. So again, I followed my love and my interest. And although I think it may not have been practical to do another two years of training, to me, it made sense because I loved it so much. Um, okay, so now we need to talk about, that's a lot about the training. So that's 15 years in now, um, I guess, 11 years of, of medic, medical and surgery specific training. So what is a pediatric surgeon? And maybe I should have mentioned this earlier. Well, we are general surgeons for children. We're general and thoracic surgeons for children. Most people don't even know what a general surgeon is. And so um, um, my partner used to say it's from sort of the chin down to like the mid thigh. We take care of all of that, but we still do pr procedures on the head and, head and face. And so there's a lot of different stuff that a pediatric and a general surgeon do. Um, pediatric surgery is really even more broad than general surgery because we do lung um, operations and esoph esophagus operations. Uh, we take care of a lot of trauma patients for trauma surgeons. We do thyroid and head and neck um, disorders. We do take care of breast diseases, so breast masses, um, lung and diaphragm problems, chest wall tumors, um, and chest wall abnormalities. Um, we take care of all sorts of congenital anomalies, babies born with their guts on the outside of their body in various formats, babies born without, without um, an anus, if you can believe it or not. Um, some people are truly born with ambiguous genitalia where it's not clear um, what the karyotype, the genetic makeup of the person is and the baby and what their um, phenotype, the outward appearance of their genitals are, or they can be, there's a huge spectrum. And, and that is very interesting to deal with. Um, we deal with a lot of tumors, um, which some of which are benign and others are, are malignant. So babies and children with, with cancers. Um, I mentioned we deal with the esophagus and the trachea, trachea being your air tube, of course. Um, main, we do a lot of intra-abdominal surgeries um, dealing with the spleen, liver, which are your, some of your solid organs. 
um, the adrenal glands, which are your stress glands that sit on top of your kidneys at the very back of your abdomen, pancreas, bowel. We do a lot of appendectomies. That's probably the main, that's the most common emergency emergency surgery we do is uh, taking out appendectomies or taking out appendixes, sorry, um, which is called an appendectomy. Um, we do anal rectal diseases. So things from hemorrhoids uh, all the way to giving a baby uh, an anus that they can poop through. If you can believe it or not, like I said, some children are born without one and you may have a friend um, or somebody sitting next to you that was born like that and you may never know. And so we like to try to give people the most normal lives we possibly can. And that's one way, one, one disease process we treat for that reason. We deal with genital urinary disorders, um, problems with um, fused labia for babies or, or girls and um, issues with foreskin and um, also problems with testicles. Some, some testicles can be undescended and we have to bring the testicles down into the scrotum. That's called an orchiopexy. Um, and so those are just some of the sampling of some of the things that we deal with. What we are not, we aren't ENT or otolaryngology. Um, so they do tonsillectomies and things like that. There's a huge overlap between my field, pediatric surgery, and all of these other fields that I've listed down here in blue. Um, we aren't orthopedic surgeons, bone doctors, but we still operate on bones like the, the ribs and the sternum, for example. Um, we're not plastic surgeons, but we do do some um, procedures on people's faces and remove remove lumps from there and things like that. Um, we aren't cardiac surgeons, uh, but we do do some procedures on the big vessels around the heart and work in the chest as well. And we're not urologists, but we do, again, do circumcisions. We do um, hernias are really more our zone, but there's some overlap there. Um, and uh, we're not neurosurgeons. We, we typically don't operate on the brain, but we help them with some of their cases. And um, so that's what pediatric surgery is. It's really awesome. It's hugely dynamic. It's a very broad spectrum of pathology that we deal with. And um, it's really exciting. All right. So what do you have to, what skills and traits do you need? Well, I think probably in most jobs, you need to have good interpersonal and communication skills. So that's really important when we're communicating with our patients and more so their families um, for a little, the little ones. It's really important, obviously, that their families are involved in the decision making. Um, and of course, you work with other people and that's the case for most jobs. But it's important to to um, be able to communicate well and to work with other people. Obviously, you have to develop technical skills. If you like working with your hands, this type of field is, is uh, full of that kind of thing. And you have to be really compassionate. And you have to um, be able to um, slip into other people's shoes and to be able to, you know, calm people or explain things in a way that you're sensitive to their needs. Um, and sometimes we're better at this than others, but I think it's really important to have a high degree of compassion. Obviously we have to collaborate. We collaborate with our patients and families and all of our colleagues. It's a really big team sport, pediatric surgery. I think in order to get through this type of training, you have to be very selfless and you have to be dedicated. It's not a nine to five job. I mentioned that we often work, even now I still work over 80 hours a week and sometimes upwards of a hundred hours a week. Um, in case you haven't had a job, a normal work week is 40 hours or 37 to 37 and a half hours. Um, and so I sometimes work that in a single shift or a single day. And um, that's not normal, but that's what we have to do to take care of our patients. Um, and you have to be resilient and find resources to help you get through the tough times because there are tough times. Do you have bad outcomes? And try as you might um, to avoid this, people people die under your care and you can cause problems for patients. And that's, that's really hard. Um, you see other people go through things like that too. And it's, um, you have to have resiliency to get through that. Um, this is sort of more on compassion. I think this is Theodore Roosevelt's uh, quote, but nobody knows how much, nobody cares how much you know, unless they know that you care. And I think that's sort of very true in, in what I do. You're, Patients and families need to know that you're invested in their, their well-being um, to trust you to do the things that you need to do to help them. Um, and so you have to be caring. You have to be compassionate um, because we are those things. And pediatric surgeons are, are very 
well known for being a softer and more gentler than more gentle, sorry, than than our adult um, general surgery colleagues and surgeons in general are known to be kind of hard and cold, but we're sort of the warm and fuzzy end of that spectrum, um, which I enjoy. And, um, you know, we, we worry a lot. You spend a lot of time worrying about your patients and decisions you've made and, and outcomes. Um, it's just part of the job. So where do we work? Well, I work all over the place. This is one of the reasons this is um, my job is so exciting because I don't sit in the same space every day. I'm currently sitting in my office, which is a bit of a mess, but um, I work at my clinic is just across the hallway here. Um, so I'm in clinic seeing patients um, once or twice a week. And sometimes I just slip patients in throughout the week if somebody needs to come see me urgently. Obviously we then go to the operating room. We spend a lot of time there. I check on my patients who I've admitted for various reasons. Some I've operated on, some are preoperative, some are just needing a little bit of support. So the in the inpatients in the hospital every day, that's part of my job. And then I work not in the emergency room, but I have to take, I have to see patients in the emergency room in consultation and um, to help the emergency doctors take care of them. And, and some of those patients obviously need surgery. So a little bit more, I won't focus too much on this because I think the reality is, um, well, it's a it's a busy job and there, we spend a lot of time at work. <laughs> so um, here's just kind of what my, my I'll tell you, I'll give you a week in the life of, of, of me in the next couple of slides. But basically Monday, Monday to Friday, we work like your average kind of sort of banker's hours plus. So we come in usually earlier, somewhere between six and eight in the morning. And I sometimes go, go, I might be lucky to go home early, like five, four or five. And sometimes I'm not here. I'm here until seven or later, um, just on a regular day. Um, we also work weekends. We work nights. Um, we take call and call, depending on what type of field you work in is different. Some people just have to answer the pager at home or check labs on the computer at home. For me, call usually means I'm working from 6 a.m. until midnight that night or later. Um, Friday night last week, I was working all day and all night for 24 hours. And occasionally we have to do that for 48 hours straight. And so um, call, when you're on call, we have a pager. We get paged by people who need um, emergency consultations for emergency medical problems, surgical problems. Um, we see consultations in the emergency room on the, the the hospital floor. You know, some of the medical patients need need a surgeon once in a while. We take calls for transfers for patients from other center, a child with appendicitis somewhere else, or a bowel obstruction that needs to be transferred in for surgical care. Um, as I said, on call we also do we take care of the emergency surgeries that need to be done. This is sort of a twenty four hour shift, but and one to three days in a, in a row. And we may or may not, like I said, get any sleep during that time, or you might get a little bit, or some nights you might get five or six hours of sleep, and you really luck out. Um, but but as I mentioned, you can be up working certainly for over twenty four hours straight. And the way we deal with that or do that is we trained for it. So that's why surgical training is so hard. Um, we spend time in clinic, as I said, and doing rounds on our inpatients. So every day I'm at work during Monday, Monday to Friday, I then obviously take care of my patients in, uh, who are hospital inpatients as well. Um, and I might have to check on them more than once a day. And I have people that help me with that as well. So for my schedule, um, on Monday, I'm here for usually about 10 or 12 hours. I see, check on my patients, um, that are admitted to hospital I then have clinic from 8.30 to 4.30, and I typically am doing my notes from clinic until about 8, 7 or 8 p.m. at night. Then on Tuesdays, I'm typically on call. So it starts at 6 a.m., but I come in at around 6.30, and the emergency room usually starts calling me at 7. I go and see four, five, or six consults in the emergency room and usually line up a few patients for surgery. Um, and I'll ch have to check in or round on my inpatients, my admitted patients, and then... Um, uh, do all the emergency surgeries that I booked in the morning and throughout the day. And like I said, I hope I get home for some sleep that night. I may or may not. On Wednesday, after I've been on call all night, I have to sometimes, I still have cases the next day, surgeries to do um, that I, I couldn't get to the night before. Um, I have to check on all my inpatients and then hope for some rest at some point. <laughs> um, sometimes I have patients popping into clinic or today I was helping a colleague. I was up last night on call and I had a, helped a colleague with a four hour case this morning. 
Thursdays is my elective OR day. So I spend about 10 to 12 hours at the hospital doing elective surgeries. And I usually three to seven cases, patients of various surgical problems. Um, and then on Friday, I have meetings, I take care of my inpatients, and I might have a smattering of the other things that I've just mentioned. So that's the week. That's the weekdays. And then I might be working both Saturday and Sunday. Um, and I might have both of those days off. I might be on the main call where I have to take care of everything or just a backup call person, which means I just have to be within 15 minutes of the hospital and ready to support a colleague if they need me. Um, so uh, it is not a Monday to Friday job. Um, and um, for example, in June, I have one weekend off. Um, but uh, most months I have at least two weekends off, uh, but <laughs> once in a while, it's only one. <laughs> so um, I don't know if I'm making this appealing to you, but I think it's important to know how these things work. I do still love what I do, even though I spend a lot of time at work. Um, so clinic, I see about 20 patients a day. I get new consultations and I see post-operative follow-ups of long-term patients that need ongoing follow-up. And sometimes I do procedures. I remove little lumps and bumps and things like that. So what do I see? I see lots of hernias, belly button hernias, which is um, umbilical hernias, inguinal hernias, which are growing hernias, undescended testes, remember testicles that haven't made it all the way down to the scrotum yet, lumps and bumps of various varieties that from skin to breast to thyroid. We see a lot of GI disease, bowel problems, gallbladder problems, pancreas problems, deal with cancers and tumor and congenital anomalies, patients that are need surgeries for those things or, or patients I've already operated it on. Um, on call work here, I'll give you just some examples. So I can come in in the morning, yesterday morning, and well, last night I admitted a patient, a 14 year old, who actually, um, uh, last night it was somebody who was on an ATV without a helmet and he has a terrible head injury and he fractured his, uh, lacerated his spleen as well. He's in the ICU. Um, but this is a very common story. I get called to see a patient who was struck by a vehicle and was brought in, flown in from a, another center. Um, transferred, uh, get a little baby, two day old baby that's transferred from another hospital with green vomit. That's never normal, by the way. Um, and well, lo and behold, he's not, he doesn't have any anus. So then I have to figure out what to do with that child. So that one's getting transferred in. I have all sorts of surgical emergencies waiting for me to, this is a, a patient who has swallowed a, a coin and is stuck in their esophagus. So that's something that's often waiting for me first thing in the morning. Um, Sometimes I have teenage girls or younger girls with ov ovarian torsion, twisting of their ovaries. And if we leave them like that, that ovary will die. It's immensely painful and we have to take them to the operating room emergently to deal with that. How about the five-year-old with appendicitis? Well, that's a pretty common one. Um, one month old uh, with um, post-op from bowel surgery who comes into the emergency room with fevers and vomiting. And I have to help try to figure out what the problem is there. Four-year-old with a newly diagnosed kidney tumor. That's always very challenging when you're dealing with new cancer diagnoses. How about this, a four, 400 gram, so a baby that fits in the palm of your hand who was born at 23 weeks. The full gestation is 40 weeks, okay? You're considered term after 37, but a normal pregnancy goes to 40 weeks. And this baby was born way too early at 23 weeks, very premature, and lo and behold, he has perforated intestine. So I have to deal with that surgically. Um, we get consults from all other parts of the hospital, and I won't go into the details around that, but this is the kind of stuff that I get called about um, while I'm on call. When I go to the operating room, I do both elective surgeries and emergency surgeries and all the things that I just, op I've just mentioned. Um, some patients are too sick to be transferred to the operating room, so we occasionally do surgeries like that 400 gram baby is too um, unstable to be transferred to the operating room, so I'll operate on, on him directly in the NICU. Um, I think that's, I have a picture of that right up top here. This is probably about a 400 gram baby, 400 to 800 gram baby. And that procedure is being done in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, so we bring the operating room to the baby. We also sometimes do this in the emergency room for traumas when we have to crack people's chests open to try to save their life and also do other procedures during traumas in the trauma bay. All right, I won't go too much into the details on this because I'm getting a bit long winded, but we ha obviously have lots of tools as surgeons, um, but the most important tools, um, and I shouldn't call them that, the most important thing is our operating room team. It's a lot of people involved in taking care of any given patient. We have lots of nurses and anesthesiologists. 
my surgical assistant, that might be one of my colleagues, or, or it could be a trainee as a general surgery resident training to be a general surgeon. Um, a scrub nurse, or in the, in the USA, they use scrub techs, um, OR nurses helping us get the patients taken care of. We have x-ray technologists that help us do x-rays in the middle of surgeries, which we need to do sometimes. Our cleaning staff is very important, obviously. We have all sorts of other people, unit clerks, sales reps, translators. We have a huge Spanish speaking population here. and We have lots of translators in our hospital. So instruments, obviously we have surgical instruments. That's a big part of what we do. You need to know what you need for each case and hopefully you have a good trained surgical team kit that can help you um, set. They set all of that up for you, but you have to tell them what you, what you want for any particular case and uh, to make sure that it goes smoothly. Blood products, we have a blood lab, a, a lab that makes sure that we have blood available if we need to, to give transfusions for patients. And obviously there's lots of medications involved. The other tools is knowing your anatomy. Okay, that's really important as a surgeon. And for some things we don't do as often, we spend time restudying that particular anatomy and the steps of a case when it's not a, a common one, if we're doing an elective procedure that is a little unique. Um, we have imaging, um, so C there's a CT scan picture up here. Um, uh, we use a lot of CT and x-rays and ultrasounds. We try to limit CTs in children because it is exposure to radiation. But here's a picture of a boy going into a nicely decorated CT scanner. Obviously the lab I mentioned, we do lab work, so that helps us make decisions about patients. Okay, so the rewards and challenges. Um, well, uh, the children are obviously the greatest reward in what I do. Um, it's really special making connections with these lovely little beings who uh, are very innocent and uh, kind and only interested in, in the beautiful things in life. And uh, as soon as they're as soon as they're feeling better, you can see it because they're up and playing and it's just such a rewarding, rewarding experience to see that. It's nice to have that connection with those people. It's nice to be able to cure people from time to time. It's very satisfying to get rid of disease. Um, it's really nice to hold the disease in your hand, to see it, to get rid of it. Um, there's something very satisfying about that. I personally have always loved being part of teams. Uh, Mr. Glutz was my coach in volleyball and and uh, I always loved um, our, our volleyball teams and his coaching and, and, and um, surgeries like that. It's teamwork. I just spent 15 years getting coached to do this. And uh, I feel like I have the privilege now to coach other people and to be a part of this bigger team. Um, mentorship falls in line there as well. I developed a lot of really wonderful mentors in, in my life. And now I'm, I'm turning around and starting to mentor other people as well. It's a huge community. This all fits together. Um, it's a very dynamic field. I'm running around a lot, which sometimes gets a bit exhausting, but it's also part of the reason I love what I do. Um, and your lifelong learning, new stuff comes up all the time. There's lots of research. It's um, amazing. You have to keep reading and keep learning and keep collaborating. Well, what's difficult about it? I think I already mentioned that that the training is very challenging. There's a lot of hours to put in. We have an atypical schedule um, and you know we work nights and weekends when other people, uh, many other people, not everybody have, have time off. And so it's hard to plan things um, uh, and that can be challenging, but you know, you figure out how to deal with all of that. The hardest challenge is dealing with complications from surgeries or medical care. Um, and, and the worst complication, of course, is mortality. Morbidity means, you know, sickness or, or complication and mortality obviously is death. And that happens in, in medicine and in surgery. And uh, so we spend a lot of time worrying and ruminating about that. And that can be really challenging, harder at some at times more than others. Um, you know, there's constraints in any system. So I would say that probably applies to all jobs, uh, resource limitations, um, you know, I don't always have all the equipment I need. I may have to make some changes to what my surgical plans are based on that, which is not ideal, but but uh, that can happen. And sometimes we're making difficult decisions. Sometimes we have to decide, does this patient, or am I going to harm this patient too much by taking to the op them to the operating room? Is it better to just let them pass away comfortably um, outside of the operating room? And, and there's a lot of um, early life and late life decisions we have to make like that, which is not an easy thing to do and is always a collaborative effort. Uh, rewards, oh, this is one of my patients. I have permission to show this. This is Santiago. He graduated from our neonatal intensive care unit where he spent the first six months of his life. 
you become very attached to these patients and to their families who you spend a lot of time with. And this is just a, a gift uh, Santiago's mother gave me. So that's it. I think you should do what you love. I did. That led me to marine biology, medicine, surgery, general surgery, and pediatric surgery. I think you should follow your heart and interest. For me, that was pediatric surgery. It was impractical. I actually knew I probably wouldn't be able to work in Canada, which was like kind of a tough pill to swallow. But I decided it was more important for me to do what I love than it was to live in Canada. I miss Canada. Don't get me wrong. And I talk about our beautiful socialized healthcare system, although it's not perfect. But in compared to what uh, we have to deal with in the States. Sometimes I think it is better. Um, I think you should occasionally be practical, <laughs> but I think you should follow your heart and interests more. For me, being practical meant for stopping being a marine mammal trainer, which was actually hard to do because I really loved that job. Uh, lean into good luck, find your mentors from all paths of your life and enjoy the ride. Life is dynamic and it's okay to retrain and reinvent yourself as an adult more than once. And that's everything. Thank you for your time. Here's my email address if you have any questions for me. Uh, full disclosure, I'm slow with email, but I will try to get back to you. <laughs> that's probably because you're a little bit busy. <laughs> <laughs> I can be. <laughs> that's it. I just, I don't know what to say, Candace. This is wow. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of questions. I think I have more takeaways than I do questions. And I think I think for students that are considering, uh, you know, any career, I think you've given some really great philosophical points. And I think one of them, the high five, one of the high five principles of uh, career decision making that we use quite a bit in, in the career field now is follow your heart. I mean, you mentioned mm. it three times and that one's, that's kind of front and center of that. And I mean, it's so important. Uh, and I think another takeaway I, I, from your session was like you love marine biology, but you didn't see the long term sustainability. Like, you know, you, you looked ahead in your life and go, can I be doing this when I'm, you know, older and and will it have that same uh, allure to it? And, 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 and you made a tough decision, I think, to probably leave that field. But yeah, probably, probably a, you know, probably, a, you know, a good decision for you. Um, so it, any advice for students that, you know, I think sometimes, and I know as a career counselor, I didn't have a lot of students that really looked at medicine in, in general, like whether it's pediatric surgery or whatnot, because I kept hearing that, oh, it's too long, I, I can't do. Uh, it, how, do you, how do you persevere through that that idea yeah. that it's just going to take me longer than it is to be a teacher or, a, or something like that? Yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good question, Kevin. I think that I honestly... <laughs> Um, at that point in our lives, you know, at the end of high school, I, I think we, I mean, I certainly felt like the pressure to get out and do what I needed to do. And I sort of felt that at every step of my training, you know, I always wanted to do the short path to get working. But then, you know, I think um, it really falls in line. Do what you love and don't worry about the time. And, you know, I know time is money and you accrue debt when you're not working, when you're training. But at the same time, I think, the benefits of that time. So, you know, I get paid very well to do, uh, to do what I do. And, and that's partly I'm getting finally reimbursed for all of that time I put in. And so I, for me, it has nothing to do about money. I would probably do this for, you know, $20,000 a year, because I love it so much. But, um, you know, I think time doesn't matter. Don't make that a big factor in your decision making, because, um, you know, I think it's important to to do what you love. And, and it feels like when you look at that from if you're 17 or 18 years old, and you're looking at 15 years of training, well, that's almost your entire life, which sounds ridiculous. But trust me, it's worth it. And um, for me, the right way to approach that was I, I was very glad that I had a career first before I went back into medical school, it gave me a bit of a different perspective, I kind of lived as an adult. And a little bit and on my own. And um, so I think um, even though our goal is always to kind of have the career and to, to be working and be productive, I think the time is really well worth it. And in the end, 15 years, I, I don't, it doesn't feel like a long time to me. Five years of general surgery residency, it was hard at the time, but I look back very fondly on those years and it doesn't seem like a long time looking back. And so Oh, when you're busy. Like, you're yeah, busy. I would I would really yeah. just say like try not to let time make a difference in your decision. Try to cut it out, in fact, because it, it in the end, as you get older, that those five, ten years, they it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, good point. Those are good points. 
Uh, with your training, like you, like you, you kept circling back to UBC, UBC. That's not that common, is it, or am I wrong? No, you're you're totally right. Um, it's unusual for people to do all of their training in one place, and I have no good reason for why. Well, I love Vancouver, and I always chose um, chose Vancouver as my top um, choice for all of the programs. So for for medicine. Um, and, um, at, at that time I, uh, I, I lived with, I guess when I started medicine, I was married and I lit, we lived in Vancouver. And so it made sense for me to try to stay in Vancouver. And, um, so, but it, most people will do a medical school in one place and they'll do residency somewhere else. And sometimes a fellowship in another place or two. And um, that's more normal. And in fact, when I when I was applying to pediatric pediatric surgery, my mentors in pediatric surgery that I, that trained me as a general surgery resident, they said, "Well, maybe you should go do like your training at maybe you should go do um, pediatric surgery at Sick Kids or something like that in Toronto, um, because it, it you know now it's a terrible term to use, but like it's kind of incestuous to sort of keep tr doing your pro training all in the same place and." Um, but in the end, they picked me and I picked them. I loved working with those people and, and I'm glad I did it. And in, in the end, it made no difference to the job I got, but I might've been more marketable in Canada um, if I had done my, my pediatric surgery somewhere oh, else. But I thought really. that was the case. I just wanted to point out to students that that doesn't always yeah. work out that way. Yeah, like you. Yeah, really no, it's it. certainly unusual. A lot of people move across the country and even across the border, you know, some people do their fellowships in the States too. Okay. No, that's awesome. Uh, thanks so much, Candice, uh, for doing this. Uh, I think uh, I think that's all we'll have for now. I'll just stop the recording at this point then. Great.